Welcome to Dan Ryland's podcast and we have a new business today that he'll be talking with, seeing their challenges, seeing what they're getting on with and showing some encouragement. Right, get ready to listen and enjoy. So you mentioned about, um, yeah, your studio kind of looking to shift into designing um, and I thought it'd be great for you to just give a little bit of um, background on on what you're wanting to do and then we can get yeah. into it. At the stage I'm at, I am trying to essentially put myself out there, get feedback um, and get the, the kind of story of what I do kind of clear to other people. Mm. Um, and uh loads of changes have happened in the last like year and a half all because of the pandemic actually which has yeah. been a bit of a silver lining um yeah so i've been able to get a studio i've never had that space before um awesome. i'm now completely self-employed not working for anyone else so not yeah. freelancing for yeah. anyone else yep yeah. um and I've just been able to start bringing in like the, the money making kind of bespoke cabinet making uh, wardrobes. I'm, this is a bunk bed that's behind me that's going to be all built in. Um, and all of that is, is good, but it's still me spending most of my week building, making. Yeah. And there is a design process that happens um, and it is also bespoke. But for me, I am much, much more interested in in the design process alone and the social aspect of design as well. So like talking to people, coming up with something and then um, prototyping at most in my own space. That's what I'd like to be doing. So I have, I'll try and show you if you can see. So just behind me is a chair up there. Yep. So that's the first attempt at um, producing some, a, a functional piece of furniture that I that fits into the studio space is physically possible for me to be making to order. So that would be the business model. Um, and then I have an upholsterer who can do the upholstered part if I don't do it myself. And um, it's also an aesthetic that I can continue to explore like later if if you know I I, I might do a footstool. If I sell a few of these chairs, um, I'm really interested in each one being, so it's, it's because it's made to order, people could talk about the color they want, the fabric that they'd like. Um, and it's and it's then also something that's on a scale I can physically cope with, like this bunk bed is too big for this space. And at the moment I can't afford to get a larger space and have all my own like machinery. So yeah. I've been able to, being in so being in Glasgow and settling here for the year and a half I've been here and the the, the one year I've been in the studio um I've got like a CNC service who can produce loads of the they can do a lot of the machining mm -hmm. um and I'm building I'm building the the design for that chair particularly around using plywood which is what they use they cut mm -hmm. with that um, and it removes all of the machining, the jig making processes for any kind of shaped pieces. So I've managed to kind of streamline all of that. And then a lot of my bespoke stuff is now being tailored to using CNC for quite a lot of the larger components of anything I do. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also trying to kind of find out how I offer my services as a designer without being asked to make stuff. So the next step for me that I'm trying to develop, um, just to continue with the background and kind of where I'm at, is um, about three years ago, I started looking into the Orkney chair, which is just a, it's a traditional piece of furniture that comes from my home. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, a, they're now, uh, they were like built out of necessity by crofters over the last few hundred years, built um, out of driftwood because there were no trees on the island. And they also had woven backs from straw, which came from the basket weaving techniques before the chair was developed. Yeah. 
and I started looking at that just as a as a designer, like with a critical eye as a designer, going into a bit of my own heritage that I hadn't really considered before, partly because cool. I don't like the chairs. Yeah. And um, I became really interested in the the history of its conception and why it was made and why it developed in the way it did. And it's now become a very commercialized post-industrial object from that has become like synonymous with the arts and crafts movement. And the V&A own some. Um, the V&A and Dundee have a piece. Uh, and like the Queen Mother had some in her collection um, and they were they became a very kind of sought after piece. So they were originally made at home for free by poor poorest crofters in Orkney um, and became luxury items sold for £2,000 a pop, mm. which is what they are now. Yeah. So for me, um, I then essentially went uh, through this process and what became interesting for me was um, what would happen if a crofter went back to the beach to get material we now have um, plastic so is there a story there is there something to do with this in the way that a crofter may have is there something to say by producing an orkney chair entirely out of recycled plastic could be hideous but I think it's a mess. So I started, I started exploring this idea. Um, and I am now in a conversation with one of the rural development officers in Orkney, specifically working on Hoy, which is one of the like the larger islands, on uh, working as a designer and a consultant um, on producing a recycled banquet table for their town hall. So it's gone from wood so my, my, my skills in woodworking and my training as a designer from art school, well, design school, uh, training uh, uh, with interior design, um, I'm now trying to like direct all of this into like projects that are also meaningful as well. Like that, that chair I'm developing is because I'm interested in it. And I'm trying to draw like all my resources together that I have access to, to produce something that could be something I can sell to make a bit of money. But um, these, this tr new train of thought over the last few years is not material dependent. It depends on the actual story, the needs of a community, the materials that are there, the current issues we're trying to work out. And it's become a much larger conversation around how, you know, we apply design as a community to problems. And how do you then like tell a story that starts like changing the way we think about material and the way we think about objects and product design. So that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm, I'm now like trying to get this project started. The community development officer is looking at funding to get me employed, um, but I will probably work a lot more than any sort of budget would pay for, yeah. because this is yeah. the start of, and I get to go home, you know, like I'd be going back and forth to Orkney working with a community I, I'd be really interested in continuing to work with. Yeah, I've then been to Strathclyde University about prototyping with 3D printers, mm -hmm. that's a project. Yeah, that's not quite getting tracked in. Um, and then I'm about to go to London on Wednesday to discuss a much broader zoomed out conversation about how we change our views of plastic. It's become mm -hmm. about plastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, by studying the Orkney chair and its history and the way people interacted with materials, it's now like drawn my attention to a totally different material I have no experience with. So this is the this is the interesting thing where I'm not qualified to talk about plastic, but I'm definitely qualified to ask about it. Mm. There are a lot of big questions that I can still apply myself as a designer and a product designer to. So yeah, um, I, does that make sense? I, sh I should probably stop there. Yep. Yeah, I think it's exciting that you're kind of. It's really clear that you're going through a really inspiring kind of self-discovery journey of one from a like a hands-on kind of your career 
piece, but also your heritage and stuff, which is really exciting. Are you documenting any of that um, in written format or video format or anything? Yeah. One thing that lockdown afforded me was time to focus on it. So mm. I basically gave myself a brief of like, get everything that you're at right now, mm. uh, bring it all together and get it into at least an A4 sheet of paper yeah. that summarizes everything. So I could send that to you. Um, and another thing is I am terrible at writing. So it's been quite good to give myself like an app, like a, a, there's an application to me writing about something now. I have mm. to get the idea across. Um, so I've now actually felt a lot more compelled to write about this subject, which is nice. Mm. I, I would also not feel pressure. Like I'm, I'm, I don't like writing because it, it takes too long to figure out the correct words to convey the idea. I much prefer telling someone because naturally writing yeah. something is a bit harder for me to, to do. I much prefer conveying an idea through spoken. So I, I would also say as part of the switch from, Hey, I don't want to just produce, um, I, uh, I, I like design and produce. I want to more so design. So it sounds like you've got the right connections to delegate some of the creation, which is good. And what I would also yeah. say, even though you've got your own studio, don't feel like that that should limit you to kind of still engage in projects, especially if you're delegating out the creation, which is great. If you want to do more design, then it's a case of telling people about it. So to tell people about it again as well, even though you're a fully fledged kind of um, sole trader uh, doing your own setup, uh, I would also not be afraid to kind of still go back into those um, kind of overflow roles or where someone right now you are contracting someone to produce stuff for you but maybe they want someone to design for them so you could go in as the designer for them so i think it's uh, all about allowing all this stuff to be quite fluid so you're never boxed into a particular area i would also add on the whole you know this story is really interesting and if you're wanting more design work then i would try and get this out publicly and i don't necessarily mean like wait until it's an a4 sheet i would say like this whole discovery piece it's not finished and that's the beauty of it it's yeah like and you're it's not to be, documenting that's not to be something to be feared as well it doesn't yeah. matter if it's not finished the, the conversation for me is only being started i'm mm. only at the very beginnings of this conversation with everyone i've been speaking to, any of the institutions i've been speaking to any of the individuals um something so you saying don't worry about like getting it on paper yet is good because um the really interesting thing about this, this like the subject of changing how we re of reevaluating plastic culturally, I mm -hmm. I want to I want to reevaluate plastic to it to an extent where I'm making people think about it as like should it not be as valuable and precious as gold mm -hmm. because it's so dangerous to the environment when misused as a disposable material. Um, how do we culturally change? The way we think of and interact with this supernatural and incredible material mm. and i don't want and i want the positive i want the conversation to be positive i don't want it to be like we have to you know i can't change the oil barons minds about producing an inordinate amount of disposable plastic that's their yeah. business i'm never going to change that but i can look at what's right in front of me if I'm going to make a decision, and I don't, I don't want to shout about the negatives. I don't want to. I, I'd rather just do something positive that involves like more than just me. So this pro, this community project in Hoy, which directly connects me back to my heritage, back to home, mm. it also which gives me a bit more of a license to discuss it, yeah. is is like the thing that's in front of me to do, mm. and people are responding to that. And another nice thing is that going down to London on Wednesday, um, this is me just being filmed talking about the project. Awesome. And what's nice is like I can, and and this is also some friends of mine. Um, they're called Vibrate Collective, and the guy I'm working with is James. Uh, what's his last name? It's not too important for this, James. Um, he put a call out at like 
maybe in June or something saying like, does anyone want to collaborate like 50-50 on a project? Uh, Vibrate are looking for, you know, essentially folio work for them. And I said, like, I kind of jokingly said, this would be really good fun. And then he asked what I had in mind. And I thought, well, I actually do have something to talk about. Mm. Um, and so he is a filmmaker. Um, he has brought together a few people. And what I sort of then discovered was because he's London based, not connected to like my Scottish, my Arcadian roots or anything. Mm. And I thought, like, maybe this is my chance to zoom out. So I've been zoomed right into um, how plastic works in Orkney and how yeah. we can be like how the Arcadian community can like show a way of like working through their heritage with this new modern material. How mm. can I then take this opportunity to zoom out and talk about the global aspects of our interaction with this material? Yeah. Which then relates to consumerism in general it, it talks about globalism the fact that like the materials that are made wash up on beaches elsewhere which is you mm. know that's the narrative I'm kind of the story I'm telling about Orkney um and can these things be opportunities and so James like loved the idea of me talking about of like talking about plastic as gold or mahogany that you'd make a beautiful piece of furniture from but how do you change, how do you start? And what you do is you start discussing it rather than yes. coming up with the final product or the, the solution. All I want to do right now is have a dialogue with as many people as possible in as many different ways as possible. And so I don't have any projects behind me yet. And I'm going to be interviewed with something I have just started talking about. Mm. And I'm not worried about that because... It might just mean I'll meet the next person along the way that gives me the right connection. Um, so that's yeah. really encouraging, actually, to hear you. I would also add, like, it, it's kind of like sometimes there's pressure. As a creative, there's pressure to create rather than to document, right? And what I mean by that is you've literally just said, I'm having all these conversations. Basically, you're doing a bunch of research. And if you could just record that research because you're doing it anyway and getting it out there, then, as you said, you might connect to the next person in the conversation in that moment, but also the yeah. publicizing of that conversation might connect you to someone else in the same way that someone else might be inspired and say, hey, I'm actually working on this project. So so long as you're kind of, you know, so long as the pressure to make money um, is not too heavy on you, then you could really go wild with the kind of documenting and recording videos. It could be just as an audio podcast starting to to pull this stuff together, start to make a noise about it. There's one that's beneficial for, you know, your own processes of documenting so you can refer back to stuff, you know, the connections that that will produce. Um, but but also for the, the your, your brand, the public perception of, of who you are. No, no one knows who you are. So now they know you're the designer kind of approach. Yeah. So I yeah. think um, uh, there's nothing wrong to say that this is a start because everything needs to start somewhere. And I think if you can, with the little that you're finding out, record those. And they don't need to be long. Like typically the interview format is the easiest way because if you're asking someone about what, how do you create plastic? Like what, what happens, you know, what happens from a council perspective when you're collecting all this rubbish from the, from the beaches? What happens? You can literally do an interview style. So it's not that you have to create anything elaborate. And you're probably doing that kind of stuff anyway. You're naturally inquisitive. You're naturally asking questions, right? Mm. Uh, so I, I've had some really interesting conversations with the Orkney Islands Council um, just yeah. starting there as, as a case study if you like I'm, I'm sort of keeping Orkney as the, 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 the case study that be, so it's something small enough for me to focus on rather than going yeah. like the entire of the UK or all of Scotland of course um, Orkney has been a nice place to start because it's it's home so uh, and I like, and the they idea. prefer that as well, right? They are more yeah. willing to back someone that's doing something in their area, because again, I think you yeah. you should properly lean into the Scottish heritage. In the same way, for me being Welsh, I found that Welsh uh, kind of platforms are way more interesting, uh, interested in, in getting you on board because one, it's kind of rare because typically everyone's in London, right? If you're a designer, you're in London. So if you can yeah. utilize the fact that 
you're around, you're interested, and and they want to be seen doing this. So you play on on on, on that kind of field. Yeah, and it feels more comfortable as well, actually, um, because I like when I, I when I spoke to Strathclyde University, who are Glasgow based, mm. um, they were providing me with whether we get anywhere with them or not, they were providing me with a lot of interesting kind of constraints, which I started bringing to the council, the Orkney Island yeah. Council. I yeah. said, like, I'm starting to look at 3D printing um, and it's all based around the Orkney chair, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Strathclyde were like, we work with ABS, hard plastics. And I then said to the council, like, do you do anything with this plastic already? And they said, no, we send it to Shetland like all the rest of our waste to be incinerated. And it costs us money to do that. If you could come up with a project that offsets and diverts this from being, you know, incinerated and costing us money, then, and there's loads of it, then, you know, great, we'll back you. Or, you know, whatever that means, whatever that backing means. Um, and then separately at uh, the, the, this project on Hoi with the, the community there has all come from a desire to reopen their public spaces, their community spaces. So mm -hmm. it's been about community, very much about community. And for me, that's interesting because for me, it's all about how do I engage in a sort of countercultural dialogue around plastic? And that mm -hmm. involves entire communities changing the way that they behave and interact mm. with stuff. And so then like the, the, it was the development officer that just came up with it on my way back to the boat. We'd finished the day out with everyone, mm. meeting the community. And he was like, could we have a banquet table? And I just went, I went, yes, yes, you can. We'll make that happen. If you can get the funding to pay me as much as I you know, can get, it's never gonna be an enormous amount. But if I can like stop working for a while and come up to Hoy and stay in Orkney and develop this, um, find all of the technology and the skills that we need, we maybe bring it to Hoy. Um, yeah. We involve, you know, we get a farmer's land involved. We, we set up, they could even set it up for us actually, depending on who we know. Mm. Um, and we get the, the school to gather and quantify the appropriate plastic. It becomes educational. You involve everyone. Massively. I think it's some when you get involved. Yeah, some call outs there. Like one, I, I've been really passionate about like what are my council doing back at home in North Wales? And right. annoyingly, there's just a, not quite enough of like, you know, that that public talk. I don't see any of the talk, right? It's all privately, mm. it's all hush hush. So they're doing some great things that they're not ready to share right now. And they might be sharing, but in kind of smaller areas. There's also the like, what do the actual individuals, the residents think and feel? And none of that is ever around. You can't see it much yeah. because again, it will be in certain areas, certain times. Uh, and I think really for the outsiders that have that heritage, that want to come back and input, I want to see what the problems are because I want to, to come to, yeah. to bring something to life that fits and aligns really nicely with the, the people and the importance of their opinion in that creation so i think the banquet table stuff is great like you said there's a massive room for community and i would try like what's what's kind of interesting is none of this is out there that this conversation that we just had i'm like whoa this stuff needs to be out there because yeah. me as a welsh person i want opportunities to, to back i want opportunities to be proud of wales and if someone's doing something or trying to get something going or just documenting that, that's inspiring to, to see. And who knows from that connection? So I'd highly recommend starting to, it, it, even, in, even if it's a two minute conversation or, or it can be as rough as anything, just start getting this out, aligning it with the, the Scottish kind of, you know, government council, you know, all that stuff and, and, and you know, community and, and making a noise about it. Because it, it reminds me also of something, just I'll, I'll reference this really quickly. Something somewhere in Europe, there's a company called T Posts. What they do is they write a story. It's sorry, it's a news article of the week. And what they do is yeah. they get an artist to be inspired by the news article and draw a t shirt. And it's a subscription based thing. Now, the t shirt then gets sent out to people that subscribe. And on the inside of the t shirt is the story, is the article that inspired mm -hmm. the illustration on the outside. And I'm like, 
again with the plastic and stuff you know if there's a school that's collecting it you know the orkney chair the history if you made something which then had the history woven in or, or tied to it somehow you know for example a chair a chair gets made if you lift up the seat of the chair underneath the seat there's actually a story right you know yes. that, that that kind of we, richness of stuff yeah we were playing with the idea of having something so i i am very particularly interested in um hallmarking plastic like jewelry mm. because it gives it an identity it gives yeah. it a time it was produced it starts telling a story that you then sort of feel more ownership over so it's like well we can't get rid of this this is like yeah. and it's tangible right it's just... this plastic that is now a seat in my school or in my house means that this plastic is not in the sea and it's yeah. all that stuff so i think there's a real richness yeah, the, there's a real the, nice story and richness to this yeah and and holding it within a circular economy and actually if you replace economy with community it becomes more uh, like matter of fact more necessity based like the the crofters for example did not go to the beach to try and save the environment they needed yeah. material they couldn't get anywhere else yeah and i love the idea of it becoming more about necessity again mm. um, and that's what I really want to, to start like encouraging people to do. And that can be done. You can zoom right into Hoi. You can encourage the community to do it there. You can zoom right out and you can start having bigger conversations about how you do it like municipally, collectively on a global scale. How yeah. you produce like, bigger infrastructures for cities to be able to do this, which is a totally different problem to rural yeah. communities. I think as well, when you talked about schools, you know, there's always that problem and councils, there's always that problem about cost cutting, you know, trying to, to do things on a, on a cheaper price. Like, is there some project somewhere where schools need some new seats? And actually, we've collected together a bunch of scrap plastic and, you know, molded this stuff together to, to create 20 new seats. It's all that stuff, you know, PR, local PR then really yeah. run with it and so long as it's really evidence that it's the collaboration with you as a designer then again this kind of stuff is all going to be beneficial for the next project the next project the next project so i think yeah i think the, the key hopefully the key message that you're feeling here is like get this story this documentation this research you're doing get it out there in the public eye somewhere it can be super rough don't wait until it's an a4 kind of like ready-made and fully designed or, or even even a finished banquet table yeah. you know like don't wait for those pro because the, i think another thing is the the more people i can get involved in making it happen in the first place the better so yeah so the story needs to be up there and um, even like creating plastic like i don't know how that's done i would love to know because then i i could be like oh could i melt down some plastic and create a cup holder you know, it's kind of empowering those like um, democratizing. Yeah, especially those three D printers, the kind of the men sheds that uh, is a community movement and, and stuff as well. So, yeah, th there's something that I thought of as well. Just in closing, there's a document. Uh, there's like a documentary kind of like TV show in America called The Profit. And what they do is they have this businessman come into different uh, American companies that are failing. And he comes in to kind of rework it to make them profitable. And I actually did it with a, um, a furniture manufacturer. Uh, and it was quite interesting just to see the story and the, and the heritage. And then he managed to turn them around because they designed three set styles and they sold it to a big um, kind of company. And I thought some of the, just some of the story, again, the American heritage, even though it's a, uh, like, it's a real strange one because it's tainted with kind of some, really nasty size to American heritage, still they're very yeah. proud. So they then do this graffiti art of their heritage because it's actually three generations and they do this massive graffiti art of this area that they love. And so, so again, it's the community, the story, how do you kind of integrate all that? So it might be with you just seeing it just to be inspired because that itself is documenting because this TV show yeah. exists of this thing. Uh, it's also turning them around to make them more profitable, but um, yeah, it might be really interesting for you to see. And yeah, I would encourage you to, to start documenting so, it. Oh, but great. it's interesting from the kind of, how do you make a manufacturing kind of design, like furniture design profitable? Yeah. So there's that side, but also just the, the importance of the story, their own heritage as a company or their own history as a company, which is really cool.
but yeah yeah it'd be cool to chat again um because i think there's some really interesting things and hopefully just as a creative i really like hearing this stuff so hopefully you'd like sharing it and um yeah i'd be more than happy if you felt uh, that you wanted to to book in another session that we have another half an hour just going a little bit deeper yeah. again I'm happy for it to be next week even. Uh, so I'll follow up with the link to this, like the profit um, TV thing, just for context. And yeah, I would highly recommend starting to publicly document. It can be as rough as a, as a YouTube video, as rough as just an audio recording on a podcast. Like it can be really well, rough. I'll have that like on, we're filming on Thursday in, in Jordan. Yeah, and that's the perfect start. So that can yeah. be the starting point to then. Um, so yeah, don't, don't wait for perfection. And yeah. don't feel like That's, you need things worked out. Yeah, I need to hear that biggest flaw. <laughs> I don't get anything. We finished. all do. Yeah, yeah. We, we all do. And I think the career the 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 journey in itself is inspiring. Yeah. Like already exactly. you've not created, you've not created anything. You've just shared with me for half an hour. I'm super inspired by what you're doing. So I'm like, other people will as well. And you've not created a single artifact in a sense of a chair or, or, or kind of the typical artifacts that you create. Right? Yeah. So the story in itself is the inspiring part. That's really, really encouraging. I'm so glad we've been able to chat. Uh, yeah, it's, well. re it's really cool. And it's nice that it's a mix of industries. I'm glad you didn't feel put off that you're doing kind of physical design because um, I do more digital design. So yeah, I think this has been great. And hopefully we can chat again next week or, or in, in a couple of weeks' time for a, another half hour. Amazing. <clears throat> well, if you'd like, we could do next week um, because everything I will have just done will be super fresh as well. Yes, uh, let's do because it. Because the, the producer is going to call me before the interview because I've not met her yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to sort of do this with her. Yeah, and she will be giving me feedback in order to produce something visual. So there's, I'm really interested to know how this conversation like continues in the next week. Yeah, and you should record that and put that as part of the documentation, right? As part of the journey yeah. thing. Hey, I had this chat with this producer. It was really interesting. You know, yeah. if you if you're fascinated by this stuff, by community, by you know environmental stuff, like sign up to this email list. You know, then you start kind of building that community up in the background, ready for when you need people to collect plastic for you, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. When we do a big bag the brock session in Orkney, which they do all the time. Yeah. I, I basically just have to go and join the wave. That's what's mm. happening. People are already discussing it and asking questions. Yeah. Precious, hashtag precious plastics. All mm. that's happened already. And none of it's new. It's just how do you add your voice? How do I as an individual yes. designer add my voice to a bigger community kind of conversation? And it's yeah. not about what I'm looking at and asking questions about mm. for everyone else's benefit. Like that is what being a designer is. Yeah, definitely. You're asking the right questions even, you know, just asking the right yeah, questions how do you ask is the right questions. Yeah. yeah, is the value. So yeah. But yeah, really good chatting with you. And enjoy the rest Fantastic. of your day. Thank, thank you All so right. much for your time. Thank you for listening to Dan Ryland's podcast today. Hopefully you've took something away from this session. And please do tweet Dan or DM him via Twitter or Instagram or look at his LinkedIn if you have any more questions about today or anything about your personal business that you might be struggling about that Dan might be able to help. Hope you have found this enjoyable and see you next time.